areas in Europe. Welcome to our webinar for the quantum safe area in the security of banks and financial institutions. I think it's quite an interesting and hot topic, as we all know. Today, we have uh, two speakers. Um, it's Olivier and Bruno. Hello. Hello, Switzerland. I will give you a little Hello. bit of advice on Hello, Bruno, <laughs> on, the, on the flow. So we'll start with Olivier. You have always the chance to uh, raise questions in the question section on uh, the webinar panel, and we will answer them in the end. There will also the chance to ask questions in the end, and we will also uh, make the recording of this session available afterwards. So if there's anything needed, um, go in the chat area, but in general questions, please in the question area. So thanks first for joining and now I hand over to Olivier. Olivier Hi everybody. You want yeah. to start? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Wonderful. Well. Uh, so I will start, I will cut off my picture because I think my slides are more interesting than myself. Uh, so here we go. Uh, so what we're talking about today is quantum safe security for banks and financial institutions. Um, at ID Quantic, we've been active for quite a while in quantum technologies. Uh, one of the turning points uh, of that, you know, the implementation of the technology in the industrial environment is this year. Uh, although we had milestones before, it's quite significant to have a chip now uh, for quantum randomness in a Samsung phone. Uh, and it shows that those technologies that were for a long time believed to be esoterical are today becoming very real and uh, small enough to go in a mobile phone. Uh, ID Quantique, as I mentioned, has been around for quite a while now uh, with a number of you know, significant inventions and innovation uh, starting in 2001 with uh, the first devices and then uh, the first uh, ID Quantic uh, QKD systems and starting to be used by actual financial institutions starting in 2007. Uh, and then of course, uh, QRNG as well, quantum random number generators, as they become smaller, uh, were progressively integrated in uh, industrial setups like the ones at SK Telecom uh, which implemented QKD technology in its 5G networks last year. And finally, as I mentioned this year, uh, SK Telecom announced the world's first 5G smartphone equipped with QRNG. So uh, that's to give you a little bit the different uh, steps in, in our company. So how would, uh, why would uh, financial institutions care about all these quantum technologies? Um, the reasons that we see and that a lot of our clients and prospects see is that what was believed as the chip was uh, an, a revolution, uh, those quantum computers will also trigger significant change in, in, the, in the world we live in. Uh, most of the GAFA companies and, and uh, D-Wave and others have put a lot of effort and money in developing quantum computers. This is happening very fast. And even the, uh, the, you know, the American government, the national security agencies have uh, advised uh, companies and governments uh, to have plans for a post-quantum uh, world. Uh, and you can see on the bottom right here, uh, and I will put up a pointer, uh, you can see on this timeline the different steps that are happening now and in the future. As you can see, it's still going to take a little bit of time to get to a state where uh, you know post quantum algorithm can be approved by all the, the the parties involved, and and we believe that's a nice complement to what we're doing with QKD and QRNG. Governments are also putting a lot of money in this. Uh, we are part of one project in Europe, which is the Quantum Flagship. Uh, this project alone is uh, financed up to 2 billion euros. So it's quite a large and innovative program. Um, in the US, the National Quantum Initiative Act also shows that the government uh, recognizes the importance of this 
and of course in China and Korea, uh, quite a few companies are working on the subject. Cybercrime in the financial industry, as you most know, uh, is increasing rapidly. Uh, it has gone from 13 millions a few years back to 18 millions per incident as an average cost. Uh, the, uh, the, the stolen record amount is also increased a lot, and the cost of those stolen rec records go to the in the $200 range. And in the, interestingly enough, half of those breaches were targeted at banks, uh, and that's you know that's uh, information from 2018. Essentially, there is two kinds of financial companies: the ones that have faced cyber attacks and that the ones that will. Those breaches also increase dramatically uh, in the total damage they cause. Uh, we've all heard about the Equifax episode in 17. Uh, in Australia, Westpac lost about 100,000 uh, files for their, from their citizens. And more recently, the Dutch Bangla Bank uh, lost three million dollars just because of a very you know standard uh, standard uh, breach so in addition to all these challenges the industry and the financial industry is also facing other challenges that they have to cope with uh, which is compliance which is coming more and more strict and and uh, forces financial institutions to take measures for the protection of the data, but also the anonymity of the data uh, and uh, to secure that the data is not used for other purposes. Um, so these three challenges we'll go a little bit into right now. Uh, why is innovation a challenge? Well, because most of, most of the banking now is happening online in a mobile way. Uh, it also, it also um, in increases the automation that banks are in, in, uh, integrating in their operation. Uh, and this is something that's happening quite rapidly as well. You can see that uh, from 16 to 17, that amount has doubled pretty much. And that's true also for high tech and fine tech, fintech companies. Uh, which you know end users are asking for. They're asking to be able to to uh, to use digital data, digital currencies, uh, and the banks have to basically offer that service. So uh, that also increases on a very rapid scale, uh, pretty much doubled also. Um, and in the next three or to five years, we believe most of the banks will have. To sort, you know, to offer those new services, all those new services obviously increase the the, the, the attack surface of, of the banking system. So just to sum up, uh, the the new disruptions that happen in the uh, financial industry, like cryptocurrencies, blockchain, and big data, AI, and machine learning, will uh, have an impact on security and the measures the bank have to be aware of when they implement them. Remember, there is a question box on the right. Uh, if you want to ask questions, we'll answer them later in the presentation. So what can be done now? What's ID Quantique's approach? Uh, to introduce this, I will uh, switch to Bruno Hutner, who is our in-house uh, QKD expert and physicist. Thank you, Olivier. So Olivier has explained to you what uh, the current situation and uh, now what's important is to understand what can be done. And uh, of course, uh, you need to prepare your infrastructure. And the first thing to do is just acknowledge the fact that there is some effect. So it's point number one here on the slide. And I can say that fortunately, we now believe that most of the companies have actually understood this point and uh, have really uh, thought is uh, beginning to think about how to uh, how to react now how to react the first thing is to conduct what we call a risk assessment to see what's happening in your company and to see 
what is the main part which is at risk and try and find out the solution. And that's the next part of the slide. Uh, and we'll go through that in a bit more detail in the next slide. So the third part is to uh, use good randomness. Fourth is to pursue cryptographic agility. And five is to really start the journey. So we will now go through that uh, point two to five a bit in a bit more detail. So Olivia, yeah. So what's at risk? Fortunately, not all of our cryptography is at risk, but part of it is, and uh, we can keep some encryption. Symmetric crypto is okay. Uh, we can keep also a lot of uh, cryptographic function called hash based functions, which are used very, very much in all cryptographic application. One is hash based signatures. You also have Mac, for example. Many functions use uh, this kind of function, and this should be saved against the quantum computer. Or maybe more precisely, the quantum computer will not destroy them. So you will have to do a few changes, increase the size of the keys, for example, but it will work. The big issue here is about what is known as asymmetric crypto, a cryptographic which is using public and private keys. And this cryptography is used everywhere, especially for key exchange mechanism and signature schemes. And these are the cryptographic schemes which are really uh, in danger now because of the quantum computer. So what do you need to do? Next slide. The first thing we said is to conduct a quantum risk assessment. So uh, in order to do that, you need to understand different parameters in your company. Not all companies are the same, or even in one single company, there are many uh, differences. So the first thing to understand is time to compromise. This is uh, what is called Z in this Moscow theorem you see here. And this is simple. This is basically how long do we see it we have until we have a quantum computer. This is not something you can uh, change, for, unfortunately, but you can follow what's going on and try to get good, uh, good ideas. So now we believe it's about 10 years, maybe something like that. What you can change, what you can control more is the migration time. So in different companies, you expect that you have different migration times depending on your infrastructure. Some companies, small companies, for example, could probably easily adapt their cryptographic infrastructure, their IT infrastructure. For other companies, it may be much, much more comp complicated. And especially, for example, for companies who have uh, both different companies, companies which are uh, a mixture of several companies, and for them, it, it may take a very, very long time to change from one infrastructure to another. So you have to look around and find out what kind of time you need to change. And that's the why of this uh, equation. And the last bit is the shelf time, the security shelf time you want for your system. And this, of course, will depend very strongly on what you're looking at. So even within a single company, different uh, usage will have different shelf time. And you will have to adapt then to see what's going on and how long you have uh, for this particular aspect of your infrastructure or this other aspect of infrastructure. And what Michele Moscat said is that if this x plus, x plus y is larger than z, and you see that on the graph, then basically at the end of z, your secret keys will be compromised and therefore you have a big issue at this time. OK, then worry. That's a kind of strange theorem when the result is worry. But uh, this has been used now uh, very often in the, the field to understand what's going on. So this particular equation is something you will have to work on for different cryptographic objects, different objects you are using in everyday life. OK, so let's now move to the next one. After you make an assessment, you start your run, your what we call the quantum journey. And there are three aspects, which again, we will discuss a bit more. It's a quantum random number generation. How do you improve randomness in your systems thanks to quantum technology? Second is to try to get crypto agility, to be able to change later part of your infrastructure to adapt to new, new things which will happen. So I think it's very important to understand that things will change and you will have to adapt and today most of your crypto is very fixed what you need to do is to change the paradigm in order to be able to react to changes in an agile way 
And the third one, which is really at the core of what we are doing at ID Quantic also, is quantum key distribution. So we'll go through that in a bit more detail in the next slide. So next. The first thing is randomness. You probably know, uh, if not, I will remain, remind you, that every crypto application starts with randomness. You always need to start with something which is totally unpredictable. Because if you could predict it, then somebody else could predict it as well, and uh, it will not be safe. So you use random numbers to generate keys which will be reused in crypto. And this is very, very general. And of course, we know that many crypto, many attacks, many hacking systems have been using the fact that the random numbers were not very good to start with. So it's very important to start with a system where you have good randomness. And thankfully, quantum mechanics is offering us the best possible quant uh, randomness coming from quantum mechanics. So using what we call quantum random number generators, we can actually achieve very good randomness, which you can then use in all your cryptography. The next step, which came a little bit too early, is to pursue cryptographic agility. So, Today, you have a given set of algorithms which you are using. These algorithms, especially the asymmetric crypto, will be broken by the quantum computer. And therefore, you will need to choose new algorithms. These algorithms are now being uh, developed, in, by, especially in the US, by the NIST. It's a worldwide competition to find out good algorithms, and they are called post-quantum algorithms. And these algorithms will probably replace most of the asymmetric key cryptographic algorithm we know today and should withstand the quantum computer. But of course, this is not absolutely certain. When you put a new cryptographic system, you are not sure of what will happen in the future. Historically, we know that many cryptographic algorithms have been destroyed. Others have, have, been, have withstood the time for a long, long time. But the parameters used in this algorithm have changed a lot. And for example, an RSA key, which was supposed to be safe with 170 bits initially, now needs something like 4,000 bits in order to be secure. So the parameters of your algorithm will have to change, and therefore you cannot be sure if the algorithm you use today will remain as it is. That's why we also advocate the use of a quantum crypto quantum key distribution as another solution, an extra solution for your security. Next. So today, and I want now to explain a little bit more what's going on today and then to see what will be the change with uh, quantum key distribution. So today, let's assume that's a typical bank uh, or financial structure where you have a data center which is connected to a recovery center or uh, a backup a data center. And of course, all the data from the original data center has to be securely sent to the other side. So the way you do it, of course, today is to use what we call a link encryptor, where the data enters a link encryptor, is encrypted via AES normally, and goes to the other side. At the same time, the encryption keys, which you generate, for example, in the data center, will be secured by another asymmetric crypto system, which is RSA, and will be sent together with the data on the other side. And of course, the danger here is if RSA is broken, the keys which you use to send to the other side will be found. And the, the, uh, since the key is sent at the same time as the data, everything will be then discovered by uh, the eavesdropper or by the attacker, the hacker. And that's the way it's done today. So it relies on two things, security of the AES encryption, symmetric, which is good, unsymmetric security of the RSA encryption, which we know will be broken by the quantum computer and have to be replaced. And that's the solution we have with quantum key distribution. Next slide. So quantum key distribution will replace the keys which were distributed by RSA by keys which were distributed through a quantum channel. So we have on the top the two quantum key distribution systems linked by a quantum channel and this will be the way to distribute between the two places a secure key 
which will then be used for encryption. Actually, in most cases, we don't replace the RSA keys, we keep them, and we simply add the other one in order to increase the security to what we had before. I'm not going to explain to you the details of the quantum channel and how it is done. The principle is very simple. With quantum mechanics, any measurement changes the state of the system you're trying to measure. So any eavesdropping attempt on the quantum channel will modify what is sent through the channel and the two users, the two data centers, or the two QKD systems in this case, will actually be able to find out that there was eavesdropping and will know that the key is not good. So quantum key distribution does not allow you to prevent eavesdropping, but it allows you, in it's uh, something very unique, to, make, to be sure that the key is safe or not safe. And if it's not safe, of course, you will not use it. That's really the principle of uh, quantum key distribution on how it can add security to your infrastructure. So let's go to the next slide. Now, here I showed you on one very simple example with link encryptors, how to use QKD. Fortunately, today, we are now have many different companies who are implementing this with our quantum key distribution system. So if you remember the previous slide, you had the quantum key distribution system giving keys to the encryptors. And of course, you can use different types of encryptors. We use, we now work with many different companies, each of them being able to take the quantum keys and use them in their own system. So we're working with Adva, with Thales, with ABNB, with ABB, with Fortinet, and so on and so forth. And we are also now working with many others, which we are at an advanced discussion, discussion stage to see how the quantum keys can be added to their system to provide an extra layer of security. Next slide. Uh, thank you, Bruno. Uh, we'll take over uh, for some uh, use cases um, of implementations and, and uh, projects with it in the financial sector. Um, one I find very interesting is the generation of digital fiat currency for central bank, uh, in which we applied our Quantis appliance to generate uh, key material for this Luna, the, sorry, the SafeNet Luna 7 HSM, which was storing the, those those uh, those keys, um, those tokens, and generating fiat currency, which were based uh, or assigned to monetary value. The second use case, or the two others that we have worked on recently, are more more uh, developed topologies. Uh, one of them is a way to go further with uh, the distribution of quantum keys over longer distances or uh, to go uh, in, a, in a chain uh, towards uh, different hops. For example, if you look from, from the top down, you'll see this is a node, this is a second node, this is a third node, uh, and we can deploy QKD uh, uh, equipment going from A to B to C, and therefore uh, encryptors uh, between A and C can also exchange encrypted uh, or data using QKD. Um, a second use case, uh, which is a ring topology, uh, so it goes like in a circle, and what you can do now is uh, also in that topology prevent failures because you have different access routes to the different nodes, right? So you can address uh, encryptor A and B, which are uh, distant from a different, uh, which have a different node uh, between them. Uh, or you could obviously also um, decrypt data between another node and A. Uh, and if you have a route that's broken or there is some uh, problem with the fiber on this route, you can use the other route. Uh, no, I'll just uh, let Bruno talk a bit more about another very interesting application, which is the quantum vault uh, for the storage of uh, crypto assets. Yes, thank you. So, um, so far, I, we discussed quantum key distribution as a way for uh, securing distribution of, uh, of, the, of data, for example. Here, the interesting application is that we are now going to use the same quantum key distribution for storage. Um, the typical case here is, let's say, if you have some Bitcoin, that's an example, any kind of digital asset will do, 
but I think many people are probably familiar with the Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency, and I think it's a good example to take. So let's say you have Bitcoin. You, as you know, the Bitcoins, um, in order to access them, you need your private key. You have your private key and your public key. The public key is on the web, on the blockchain, but the private key is basically your title of ownership of your Bitcoin. If anybody can take this private key or steal it from you or learn it from your something else, then you lose your Bitcoin. So you need to store these keys or these assets very securely. So of course, what you use normally is what is called an HSM. So here we say, generate the key with the quantum random number generator, and then you store in what is called a hardware security module. That's where you store your keys. But you have an issue here. If you store them in one location and something happens, you lose them. And in contrast to what you have with banks or so on, if you lose your keys, you lose your Bitcoins or whatever asset you have. So you would like to somehow be able to store them in a secure way, but still be able uh, also to make a backup. The risk here is as soon as you make a backup of this key, anybody with a backup could also steal your Bitcoin. And the way we found to avoid that is to use what we call now the quantum vault. So you generate the keys and then you split the keys into several parts, which we call shards. And these keys are then distributed to remote HSM, as you see on this uh, on the slide. And the very interesting thing about this Shamir secret sharing for the keys is that anybody with one or two shards, for example, in this case, cannot recover the full key. And anybody with more than three or more key, or more shards can recover the key. So in this way, you can lose one of the HSM, you can even lose a second one and still recover the keys. But on the other hand, if somebody is accessing illegally your HSM, there is no risk. The only risk which remains here in this scheme is how do you send your, your, your bits of keys, your, your pieces of keys to these different HSM. And that's where we advocate the use of quantum key distribution for secure transmission. Because in this case, even though you send the keys to a different location, logically, it's exactly like you had the keys in the same location. There is absolutely no risk by taking these pieces and sending them to this remote HSM because it's a totally secure communication. Okay? In this particular example, we say three out of five nodes are enough, but Shamir secret sharing is very, very flexible. And if you have keys of very high values, for example, you can easily say, okay, I want more HSM. I want to store in 10, for example, such that out of the 10, six would be enough to recover. You can really devise a system to be very, very flexible and as secure as you want against different kinds of attack, eavesdropping, uh, hacking, destroying the place, earthquakes or whatever. And we believe this is a very good way to store your keys in a very secure way. And I think it's back to Olivier. Yes, it is. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, so just to recap, a few takes away. Uh, take away uh, point one, do not delay. As we've seen, it's probably already too late. Uh, so uh, assess the risk, uh, define a strategy, um, prioritize the data that you have, which, which, uh, which data or which part of your network is at risk and has the most exchanges on it. Uh, and to do that, obviously, a simple step is to improve entropy and key generation. Uh, so you sure you have a real entropy and, and uh, as Bruno mentioned, do, do not take any risk on that part. Uh, crypto agility, of course, uh, make sure that you can uh, adapt to new algorithms. As, as you've seen, it's going to take a while for one to be adopted and uh, it might take even longer uh, if you know some 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 people find algorithms to crack these first iterations of those algorithms, and and therefore also use QKD as an additional layer of security to your uh, current operation, as you've seen, it's an additional layer that doesn't require to change everything, but basically adding a layer of security. Of course, uh, this has to be adapted to your own use. Uh, a hybrid systems and. XOR of the keys has been proven to be safer than not doing that. So I think we're about at the end of this presentation. Um, I think it's time to respond to questions if we have any. Um, 
yes, I think there's a question here about limitation in distance. Uh, it is true that uh, for QKD, uh, quantum key distribution, uh, there's a limitation which is due to the physics of, of light. Uh, so the fiber absorb a certain quantity of light in, in the distance. Uh, and we're limited to between 50 and 100 kilometers per, per node, per hop. Uh, obviously, some of the, the topologies I showed for QKD now allow to have trusted nodes in between and to extend that reach. We're also working on satellite projects that obviously uh, get rid of that limitation by being able to distribute keys from satellite through, fr through free space communication. Um, we have, uh, Catherine, uh, a poll, a few polls here that I would be interested in submitting to you. Uh, I will launch them now. And I'll give you a couple of minutes. Okay, so I'll close the poll. Hopefully everybody was able to vote. So 25% of the attendees uh, see that in the next six months, uh, they might have projects in that field. Uh, 13 next 12 months and 63% not planned yet. So we'll have to talk. Uh, let me put up the second one. When do you think your company should start its quantum journey? I would appreciate if you can vote on that one as well. Okay. Nice to see that 40% uh, in the next two years, actually 50%. Let me close this. And I think we have a last poll. which is, did this seminar reach your expectations? Wonderful, I see 82% have responded yes. So thank you very much. Uh, anybody else? And for um, the others, you can ask. You can still ask questions if you want to. Yeah, of course. And feel free to let us know. Any other questions? Uh, Bruno, you want to look at the question? Yes, there was a question about physical layer. So uh, it's absolutely is... true. It's absolutely true yeah. that uh, QKD, uh, I believe the question is for uh, QKD, it's absolutely true that QKD is based on physical layer, which means that somehow in order to do a QKD link, you need to send photons from one point to the other, real photons, and to work with them. Uh, what people tend to forget is that this is exactly the same with internet. When we are discussing between us uh, at very different locations, we actually send photons over optical fibers everywhere around the world. The only thing that today we have these optical amplifiers, so we send a photon and it can be uh, amplified and amplified and amplified, and it can reach any number, any numbers of any thousands and thousands of kilometers. Today we cannot do that with uh, quantum key distribution, so this is a limitation. But there is no in principle uh, distant in principle limitation for the future. People are working on quantum repeaters, which will exactly be the equivalent of these optical amplifiers we have for classical light, which we use today for the internet. So when QKD goes to, uh, uh, let's say, a more mature technology, 
2G. It could be used everywhere and it could also long, reach very long distances. And it will be a kind of layer of the a quantum layer, if you want, of the internet, which people can use even without knowing it's there. And there, there shouldn't be any major difference between that and what we are using today. Thank you, Bruno. Yeah, don't hesitate if you have another question, otherwise. There's another Axel, question. Do you want to add something? Uh, yeah, there's another question. Uh, it's regarding the, do we have some examples? I guess it's in the background. Do we have already some examples uh, of enterprises working with QPD? Um, so I think we have <laughs> a couple of them. So I'm not sure. Yeah, I think if we, if we are now in the finance industry, we have uh, for sure a couple of customers who have tested this. And we have also some customers which are not allowed to uh, share the names. Yeah. Of yeah, me. as I mentioned, there is there is uh, banks uh, in Switzerland that have been using QKD for ten years now. Uh, others for less time. Uh, also have commercial clients using it actively uh, in, uh, in the US and South America. Unfortunately, yeah, it's really hard to divulge any names yet, unless we have an NDA or have it, the authorization of those clients. But it's easy to get a demonstration and uh, also link you to people which can then confirm what they what's their experience because that's true. What, uh, maybe not that clear out of the presentation. It's very easy to add to your actual security architecture because typically you don't have to change a lot. It's only you have to make sure that your encryptors get this uh, connection to the QKD system. In this case, from us and use these keys and then you are already on a much better position as you are right now so it's uh, not a complex approach for sure uh, the fiber and all the stuff has to be given but uh, besides this that's a very easy to implement solution so i think uh, there's another question coming in um, there's one comment from a colleague, which is quite good, uh, because we have in Europe an open QKD project, and there are a couple of examples. There's a website we can share after this. You can have a look about the different uh, use cases uh, which are built in this open QKD, let's say, uh, project, which is growing across Europe in all more or less all major countries, also smaller countries are involved and uh, make local implementations of this technology. And this project is also, uh, to a great extent, supported by us. OK, wonderful. OK. Yeah, it looks like uh, these are the questions for the moment. So we have to say thank you for your participation. Olivier, thank you, any for having you. Yes. Uh, yeah, please, obviously, uh, my email is on the slide that you're looking at. So if you have uh, questions or further questions you didn't think about right now, you can obviously email me directly uh, and I'll be happy to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank and you all. To see you on a Thank you. Thank you, Olivier. Thank you, Bruno. Uh -huh. Have a nice afternoon, morning, evening, wherever you are. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye, everybody.